welcome everyone. Um, it's great to see some um, really friendly faces and um, photos in the in the audience. So um, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we're just going to kick off with a, a quick video um, on Euphro, I think, um, and then we'll we'll jump into the talks. Hello, my name is Todd Ramsfield, and I'm the coordinator of a Euphro Division 7 Forest Health. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar series. Before we begin the webinar, I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce a Euphro and to let you know how you can become involved. IUFRO is a global, non-profit, non-governmental, and non-discriminatory scientific organization that has been operating for over 125 years. There are approximately 600 member organizations spread across over 120 countries, and more than 15,000 forest scientists participate within IUFRO. IUFRO is open to all individuals and organizations that conduct research on forests or forest products. One of the primary activities of IUFRO is to promote networking and knowledge exchange in order to provide science-based solutions to global forest challenges. IUFRO is composed of nine divisions that cover research on all aspects of forest science, including silviculture, physiology and genetics, forest operations, forest assessment, forest products, social aspects of forestry, forest health, forest environment, and forest policy and economics. Specific subject areas within divisions are captured within research groups. For example, within Division 7, we have two research groups, forest pathology and forest entomology. Research groups each contain working parties that are focused on more specific subject matter. Another major component of a UFRO structure is task forces. Task forces are temporary and composed of interdisciplinary teams that are focused on specific emerging topics. This slide shows the composition of Division 7. As you can see, there are two research groups, forest pathology and forest entomology. Within these research groups, there are 11 and 14 working parties respectively. The working parties include research on all aspects of forest health. It's often said that working parties are the active heart of a UFRO as these groups get together regularly for meetings focused on their areas of study. And you can see some photos at the bottom of the screen from pre-COVID working party meetings. Due to the global pandemic, we have had to postpone in-person meetings, but it is very important that networking and communications are maintained. Therefore, we have transitioned to online meetings and webinars. These meetings have lowered the barriers to participation in working party activities and will hopefully open the doors for more researchers. The current webinar series will take place over October, November, and December, with a webinar every other Wednesday beginning on October the 13th. As you can see, the webinars in this series are intended to be of broad interest to all researchers within Division 7. Note that the start time for each webinar will vary to accommodate the arrangers and speakers, but they will all be recorded and uploaded to YouTube for future reference. This is the third series of webinars, and two other series have already taken place. The first occurred from September to November 2020, and the second from January to April 2021. The webinars have already been uploaded to YouTube, so you can go there to watch them if you are interested. We are hoping that a reduction in COVID will allow in-person meetings again in the near future, and two of the upcoming events that we want to bring to your attention are the All Division 7 meeting in Lisbon, Portugal in September 2022, as well as the Russian Regional Congress later in September of 2022. Further information for these conferences can be found on the UFRO website or the websites of the meetings themselves. Finally, a UFRO is open to everyone involved in forest research. If your institution is a member, you are automatically an IUFRO member. For example, graduate students that are studying at a university that is affiliated with IUFRO are able to participate as full IUFRO members. In my experience, IUFRO is very welcoming and hopefully you will be able to participate. Feel free to reach out to me, my email address is on this slide, or any member of the coordination team. We are easy to find on the UFRO website as well and happy to chat. Thanks and enjoy the webinar.
Fantastic, cool. Well, um, yeah, so welcome everyone for this, um, the second installment of the Division 7 Forest Health webinar series. Uh, I'm Stuart Fraser, I'm a forest pathologist um, at Scion, um, and I'm the uh, coordinator for um, Working Party 70213, um, which is um, Forest Health in Southern Hemisphere commercial plantations, which um, have uh, we've organised this this webinar. Um, so just first up, a, a thanks to Irene and, and Fabi uh, for uh, helping to organise and, and doing a lot of the, the work and, and letting us use the Fabi kind of platform um, for these webinars. So thanks a lot for that. And, and just uh, thank you to Kira and to Felipe, two PhD students at Fabi, um, who will be um, assisting today. Um, so thanks a lot for that. Um, yeah, as I said, this is webinar two, um, and we're organised by the uh, Working Party Forest Health in Southern uh, Hemisphere Commercial Plantations. Um, this um, Working Party is, I'm, I'm the coordinator, um, but uh, the deputies are Angus Carnegie at the Department of Primary Industries uh, in New South Wales, Australia, Carlos Perez um, from um, Uruguay, and Rodrigo Ahumada um, from Arico in, uh, in Chile, um, yeah, who helped organize this, um, this uh, webinar as well. Um, we've got four um, exciting talks today, uh, which I'm really excited about. And, and excitingly, we have four talks uh, from four different continents today, so which I think is, is fantastic. Um, so first up, we've got, we've got Angus, um, who's gonna be talking about um, uh, the fires in the Australian plantations and, and salvage uh, operations. Um, then Brett's going to kind of give us an overview of um, the development of a coordinated uh, forest pest uh, surveillance strategy in South Africa. Uh, then we've got a talk from Marvin about um, management of insects and pathogens in, in large uh, commercial nurseries in Indonesia. And then we wrap up quite nicely with a, a talk on One Health, which is a, a topic which is uh, gaining uh, more and more um, attention. So uh, without further ado, we'll jump into Angus's talk. Uh, and Angus Carnegie is a, a forest pathologist, um, as I said, at the New South Wales um, Department of Primary Industries. Okay. My name's Angus Carnegie from Department of Primary Industries in Sydney, Australia. I'm going to describe some of the monitoring work that we did in Pinus radiata plantations following the 2019-2020 uh, bushfires. The black summer bushfires in Australia were incredibly large and horrendous. Uh, 8.5 million hectares of forest were burnt um, and the fire season ran from about August in 2019 uh, well into um, uh, late summer in 2020. But you can see on the right there uh, the extent of fire burnt area in Eastern Australia. The Duns Road fire in uh, Batlow, New South Wales started in late December and ran for a bit over a month. Uh, 334 hectares were burnt uh, and this uh, included about 36% of the plantation estate in the uh, Tumut and Tumbarumba area and a massive salvage program was subsequently initiated. Um, we started the trial in February, uh, um, just after the fires had been extinguished, and the aim was to monitor tree health, Ips bark beetle attack, blue stain and moisture content, to gather data to assist with the salvage program. There was a need to have objective data to assist with optimising salvage decisions uh, as the expected log downgrade uh, escalated. We set up sites that were representative across the burnt area in a range of age classes 15, 20, 25, 30 and 35 year old in three different uh, th um, silvicultural regimes, unthinned and first and second thinning, 
uh, three broad elevation ranges across the burnt area. And with each um, site having multiple burn severity classes. And this was uh, determined using the rapid assessment of fire impacts on timber model that was developed from uh, satellite imagery, uh, looking at pre and post burn um, sentinel data. We ultimately had 14 pot plots, each with three to four burn severity classes uh, with 44 subplots across the area. Uh, of 23 plots. We had four burn severity classes, total burn where the trees were totally burnt, uh, full scorch, uh, uh, trees were scorched, burnt in the bottom uh, with brown needle still uh, attached. Orange was a part scorch where most of the tree had scorched or burnt with some green crown in the upper part of the tree. And then the fourth category was uh, green trees, which may have had some burn in the lower part of the crown. We had 20 tree plots uh, to monitor Ips attack and tree health. Uh, the initial assessments included height and diameter, then green crown depth, crown consumed, crown scorched, char height and ground char score, all looking at uh, burn severity uh, or burn intensity uh, impact of the trees. So with the tree health assessments each month from February 2020 to March 2021, we assessed the health of the crowns, uh, looking for a change in tree health, um, and then Ips attack based on FRAS and uh, looking also at the severity or the intensity of Ips attack on trees. We also did fell tread assessments. So to monitor degrade from bluestain moisture content and potential decay getting into the trees, uh, one representative tree per plot uh, adjacent to the plot trees uh, was initially uh, assessed using the uh, resi drill, which looks at density of the tree. And then the tree was felled. Uh, Hitman data was collected on a six meter log, which looks again at density um, within the tree. Um, and then we cut the tree into two meter sections and assess the face of the discs for uh, blue stain. And then we diagnose this if possible. Uh, and the diagnosis was, was pretty um, uh, coarse. If we saw um, Ips attack, then the blue stain was associated with blue um, ophiostoma. If we didn't see Ips attack, then the blue stain was associated with diplodia. We also collected some samples to confirm this diagnosis um, along the way. We also collected moisture content in these felled trees. So three discs were collected from each uh, tree per plot um, and a disc taken from the base, the middle and the top of the tree. We ultimately had uh, 1,866 discs uh, that were brought back to the laboratory and three wedges were taken from those to look at uh, moisture content uh, at various um, parts of the tree. We also established uh, 15 uh, panel traps with uh, Ipsenol lures to uh, monitor for bark beetle populations across the uh, burnt areas. Uh, most of these were adjacent to our uh, plots. So if we look at the results, this is a graph showing the percentage of trees with Ips attack in the 20 tree plots, uh, looking at the uh, four burn intensities or burn severities, total burn, full scorch, part scorch, and live uh, from February 2020 to March 2021. And you can see there was a significant increase in Ips attack from around spring onwards from uh, late September onwards. We had very high numbers of Ips by, by mid-summer in the uh, total burnt, full scorch and part scorch trees. And green trees didn't really start getting Ips until that summer period. Uh, and this was important for, this, this was potentially important for the salvage program. If we look at the percentage of blue stain on the felled trees, and so this is a mean of blue stain on those two meter logs 
in the bottom third or the basal third of the tree, the middle third of the tree, and the top third of the tree. Again, uh, you can see the four burn severity classes across the assessment period. From winter 2020, we started to see an increase in blue stain. Um, overall, we had low levels of blue stain in the base of the tree uh, and moderate to high levels of blue stain in the middle and the top of the tree. Most of the blue stain was in burnt trees, uh, the various uh, burn severities, uh, but we did see some uh, green trees with blue stain uh, in them. And we determined that most of the blue stain, at least through the early parts of the uh, period, were caused by diplodia. Uh, once we started to see more Ips attacking trees coming into summer, we started to see more uh, blue stain associated with Ips. Um, and what was interesting for me that uh, in discussions that we were having with the mills, that there appeared to be negligible impact of blue stain uh, in the sawmills. Uh, and so we're able to continue the salvage program through all this period. Uh, we monitored uh, the change of uh, Crown Health. This is a bit of a messy graph, but um, if you just have a look at the uh, blue, uh, sorry, the green uh, bars, you can see there was a decrease in green trees uh, through the assessment period. And if you look at the red bars, you can see there was an increase in brown trees through the assessment period. So overall, we saw a uh, decrease in the health of trees in the plots over the assessment period. Moisture content uh, was a critical part of the program, uh, simply because uh, it's one of the key components that the mills are interested in. Um, again, we've got uh, moisture content at the four uh, severity intensities, burn intensities, uh, and from the base of the tree, the middle of the tree, and the top of the tree. Um, the base of the tree, we saw an overall decline uh, in moisture content, uh, real, not particularly significant decline, and there was no significant differences in moisture content between the burn uh, severities at the base of the tree. However, for the middle and the top of the tree, we saw significant declines in moisture content from spring 2020 onwards uh, compared to the green trees. Uh, and with the top of the, tr the, top of the tree uh, significantly drier uh, again in the middle of the tree. And so importantly, how did the monitoring program that we uh, established uh, inform the salvage priorities? Um, remembering that there was um, a very large area of salvage to uh, for burnt forest to be salvaged. Uh, and the original thinking was that it was going to be too much burnt area to be able to go through the mills uh, effectively. And so following the fire, we were expecting to get about nine to 12 months of salvage. Uh, before summer 2020 uh, became too hot, resulting in significant log degrade. And this is what we'd experienced in previous uh, summer fires, uh, that we would get about nine to 12 months before uh, we would have issues in the mills with uh, uh, degrade of the burnt trees. So the monitoring data was needed to pro provide some objective decisions to adjust the salvage uh, program to maximise volume recovery. For example, we're thinking that we might need to utilise only the butt logs from certain age classes, or we might need to move into certain areas uh, to salvage uh, that had less degrade. However, we had an unusually wet and cool spring and summer in 2020, and the salvage program went on for much longer than anticipated. So mills were still accepting logs 18 months after uh, the fire had gone through. And so in the end, our monitoring data was not required for salvage considerations. Um, so in concluding, uh, Ips and blue stain increased in burnt trees, uh, probably not too surprising there, uh, and the moisture content decreased, again, not surprising. The base of trees stayed moist and relatively free of degrade, and this assisted in uh, the salvage uh, recovery program because it was the base of the trees uh, where most of the logs uh, uh, 
uh, high quality logs are uh, coming from. And the wet and cool spring and summer extended the salvage program. And so future work, we wanna see how we can utilize this data as well as tapping into the operational salvage data and data from the mills to assist with any future salvage programs. Uh, thank you. Sweet. Thanks, Angus. Um, one thing I, I forgot to note in the, um, in the introduction uh, was that what we'll do is in between the talks, we'll do one question um, and then we'll have a discussion after we've had all four talks. Um, so I'll hand over to Philippe. I'm just seeing the question in the box now, in the chat box now, and um, I don't see any raised hands. So let me, ah, we have a, well, uh, by order, we have Jeremy. Like, uh, Jeremy, can you uh, unmute yourself? Yep, can you hear me? Yes, hear you. Thank you. Hey, Angus, I enjoyed your talk. Um, I'm wondering, you know, does this sort of decision matrix system exist in other parts of the world? So. This is an issue that happens all the time in, in, in Canada, and I'm not aware of you know, empirical work that's been done to provide a decision matrix for stakeholders in, in this part of the world. And so I'm wondering, you know, does it exist? And I just don't know about it or? Oh, yeah. Hey, Jeremy, how are you going? Um, good question. Yeah, look, when we had all the fires and they were still raging, we actually did a review of previous fires to try and get a handle on how long um, we had to do the salvage. There was a question about whether we uh, would leave um, trees on the stump or logs on the stump, I think they call it, or put it under sprinklers or in dams. And the sprinkler and dam option was gonna be really difficult um, and almost logistically impossible in the time frame. And so uh, we had quite a few um, best guesses on how long it would take to um, to, for the salvage program before we had log downgrade, but they were just snippets of uh, often just ad hoc or personal observations and things like that. So I'm not aware of, of any type of empirical data like this. And, and we just thought we needed to capture this to, to help with the salvage program because it was such a massive program. You know, it was a, it was a, a, a third of the plantation estate uh, down in that region. Um, and yeah, supplied um, a big, you know, half the half the mills with um, with timber. So, but yeah, I I haven't come across anything myself. All right, thank you. And and so, to, and I suppose that was part of my final comment was that we were hoping to be able to use it, you know, on the run with the program, and we had such good weather we didn't. But what I'm hoping to be able to do is actually tap into what was actually happening during the operational salvage, but also what the mills were getting and see whether we can, um, yeah, develop some sort of matrix that'll help us into the future. Maybe in touch. <laughs> Sweet, um, thanks Angus, thanks um, Jeremy. Um, so next up we've got uh, Brett Hurley, who's a forest entomologist at, at Fabi at the University of Pretoria. Um, um, maybe while we're waiting, I'll just, because um, I, I realised I kind of forgot to give much of an overview of, um, of our working party and kind of what, what, we're being, what, we, what we do, I suppose. But I'll kind of, I'll make the aim, main aim of our working party is to improve management um, of forest health um, through uh, increased uh, contact and collaborations um, uh, between forest health professionals and we've kind of we've got to focus on common uh, species and commercial pine plantations in the southern hemisphere so uh, pine eucalyptus acacia um, and obviously we kind of have a southern hemisphere focus but uh, an interest in northern hemisphere as well and, and open to anyone from the northern hemisphere who works on uh, similar systems uh, we're interested in pathogens and pests um, or i should say insect pests um, so um, looking at both because often um, practitioners work on both um, in, in these situations. Um, yeah, we had our first meeting in Uruguay in, in 2018 and then we, we were going to have a meeting this year um, at Fabi uh, with the um, uh, 
vascular wilt diseases and the ecology and management of bark and wood boring insects, uh, working parties, but obviously that was cancelled. Uh, but we have put in a session uh, for the Division 7 conference next year. So um, hopefully hopefully that happens and, and we, we'll be there. So, um, but we, we have an email list. We don't, we don't send out too much, but if you are interested um, in knowing more, just, um, just drop me an email. Um, and you can find that if you just search my name and Sion, I'm sure you'll find that. Um, do we have the Brett's video? Sorry. Greetings to you all. Today I'm going to provide an overview of forest pest surveillance activities in South Africa, which has been an example of a successful industry government university partnership. I'll discuss some of the successes, but also the challenges of forest surveillance activities in South Africa, and briefly mention some of the recent efforts to develop a more coordinated surveillance strategy. Most of the examples I provide are on insect pests, but the broader principles discussed are relevant to surveillance of both diseases and insect pests. But first, let me provide some background on forestry in South Africa. South Africa is a relatively dry country with only about half a million hectares of natural forest. These are highly diverse environments and are mostly protected. In addition, we have 1.2 million hectares of planted forests, grown for a wide range of products, including timber, mining poles, wood chips, pep, paper, pulp, furniture, and cellulose. These consist mainly of different pine and eucalypt species, and of wattle, case of moon's eye, all of which are not native to South Africa. Interestingly, and of relevance to research funding and development and implementation of surveillance strategies, most plantations in South Africa are privately owned, and of these the majority owned by large-scale corporate companies. The South African forest sector contributes to over 150,000 jobs and about 70 billion rand, which is about 2% GDP, into the national economy annually. These plantations also contribute to ecosystem services, for example through carbon sequestration, and are responsible for the protection of about a quarter of the country's natural forest. There are a number of threats to South Africa's forest resource, both native and plantation forests. These include abiotic threats such as fire and drought, which South Africa is particularly vulnerable to given the dry climate in many regions. And as with plantation forests in other parts of the world, one of the greatest threats to sustainable plantation forestry in South Africa are insect pests and diseases. Introduced pests from the native range of the host tree can be particularly damaging as the pest suppression factors, whether top down such as natural enemies or bottom up such as host resistance, are often reduced in plantations of non native species. A well known example in eucalypt plantations around the world is the eucalypt snout beetle, which can result in severe defoliation and consequent loss of growth. Another well-known example of introduced pests within pine plantations is the Cyrix wood wasp and its symbiont fungus, which can result in dramatic tree mortality, especially in stressed or poorly managed stands. Introduced pests have become an increasing threat to forests due to the exponential rate of introduction of these pests. For example, the first 100 years after introduced forest insect pests were first reported in South Africa, only 12 insect pests were recorded as introduced, giving an average of one introduction every 8.3 years. However, between 1993 and 2014, so a 21-year period, there have been several introductions, a rate of one insect every three years. Interestingly, introductions of the last two decades have been dominated by eucalypt pests. This is of concern given that the bigger forest companies are increasing their proportion of planted land to eucalypts and the importance of eucalypts to the small-scale farmers. A native pest can also result in severe damage in plantation forests. For example, here you see defoliation of wattle caused by a native Lepidopteran species. Such high infestations of these larvae are very sporadic, sometimes with many years between outbreaks. One of the main challenges with this, as well as many other native species, is the lack of knowledge around the factors driving outbreaks and therefore the ability to predict outbreaks. As with introduced insects, the number of native forest insects is also increasing due to continuing host expansion of native insects and pathogens, 
from the native host to the non-native plantation species. An important part of a pest management strategy is surveillance, as this informs the timing of a management response and the type and extent of the response. When I refer to surveillance, I'm con considering three main components. Early warning, which is aimed at detecting the presence of a new pest introduction with the objective to detect it as soon as possible after it enters the country, while it's still localized, so that different management options can be considered, possibly even eradication. Delimiting surveys, these would generally follow the detection of a new pest with objective to monitor its spread over time and is sometimes linked to whether a particular management approach has been successful. And then monitoring, which here refers to the monitoring of changes in the population density of the pest or levels of associated damage over time. This would be for pests already established in the country, whether native or introduced pests, where the collected data can be used to indicate when management intervention is needed, if current management practices are successful, biotic and abiotic factors that could be influencing density, and develop predictive models of outbreaks. In South Africa, these type of forest pest surveillance activities have been led by an industry government university partnership. This model has generally worked well, but there are changes in optimization needed, especially with the recent decreased support from government. When it comes to detection of new insect pests and diseases, this has primarily been through field extension activities of the Tree Protection Cooperative Program, as well as the forestry companies, such as in response to observations from farmers or when assessing trial flux, which is how the leaf pathogen threat to sphere destructions was first reported. And to support early pest detection, it is important to have rapid and accurate diagnostic capacity. We have made good advancements in this area, for example, lamp primers developed for the pitch canker fungus through a collaboration between Fabi and the University of Georgia. But there are a number of pest groups for which we don't necessarily have good diagnostic tools. Thus, if it is needed to first identify potential new pest species or groups, and then ensure that we have the diagnostic tools required to confirm the identification, should they be detected. One initiative that contributes to that objective is the Forest Insects Mitochondrial Barcode Database, it was known as FIMT, which was started by Fabi. This is specifically for insect pests of eucalypts and pine and aims to provide a reference mitochondrial sequence database that can be used for diagnostics of potential new pest introductions. However, despite these various initiatives and activities around early detection, what is largely absent in South Africa is targeted surveillance around potential entry points, be it ports or other suspected entry points, such as those sections of the country's border in close proximity with neighbouring country borders. I think this restricts our capacity to detect pests at an early stage before they are widely established. When we consider delimiting surveys in South Africa, one of the best examples would be for the Syrinx wood wasp, which was first detected in the country in 1994 and then in the summer rainfall area, which is the main pine growing regions in 2002. The monitoring of the spread of Cyrex in South Africa involved the use of beta traps as well as field scouting. The initiative was led by the National Cyrex Steering Committee and involved industry, government and research groups such as Fabian and the ICFR. Government provided considerable funding for this project and I think one of the concerns or questions is that given the recent reduced funding from governments in South Africa to support plantation tree health, would we be able to implement such a program for the next serious pest introduction? When considering monitoring changes in pest density and associated damage, one of the main recent projects has been for the eucalypt gall wasp, Riptisabe invasor. This project has been coordinated by Laurie Hermes Hazen from the ICFR but the monitoring is conducted by the forestry companies themselves. So here the level of galling has been monitored across the eucalypt growing regions on an annual basis since 2016. The data can be used to give an indication of increasing or decreasing population levels and also possible patterns with regards to preference of different eucalypt species and the influence of different regions as illustrated um, in the graphs. Within the same broader project we've also used it to monitor the establishment of the different biocontrol agents, as well as the distribution of the two genetic Leptisabi lineages present in South Africa, 
the data that is not shown here. So in summary, there have been some great successes in forest pest surveillance in South Africa within this industry government university partnership. But there are also some challenges and I believe risks in our current approach for pest surveillance. These include the lack of government funding, which limits the scale of surveillance activities, with some, for example, target early detection surveys currently absent. In addition, we need more rapid diagnostic tools for potential new forest pest introductions. And there's a limited knowledge in the population dynamics and therefore tools to predict outbreaks for many of our pests. And very importantly, there's a very crucial need for better coordination between the current surveillance activities that are happening, including tools to improve, improve the data capture, the data sharing, and the data access. One of the tools being developed, which will allow a much more coordinated forest pest surveillance strategy, is the Innovation Africa Information Hub. This process is being led by Bernard Slippers, but involves a big team particularly Fabi postdoc Quentin Santane, Laura Hermeshazen, and the ICFR and computer engineer Arne Schroeder. The information hub will provide a platform for surveillance data to be captured, whether related to early detection, delimiting surveys or monitoring. And tools on the same platform can be used for data processing, analysis and visualization, with the objective of near real-time visualization of captured data. And there are also ongoing projects to develop machine learning and prediction tools. There has already been considerable progress with the development of the Information Hub, which has both agricultural and forestry applications. And in the next couple of years, the aim is to further optimize the Innovation Hub for use in forestry surveillance and increase the uptake in the forestry sector from small growers to forestry researchers. We think the Information Hub will enable the development of a more coordinated surveillance strategy that captures data from various surveillance activities or inputs shown here in blue and allow access and visualization of that data for a farmer manager or researcher in near real time, which is shown in the red blocks. As discussed previously, some of the surveillance activities are already in place, such as field extension. These are shown here in dark blue. Others indicated in the lighter shade of blue, such as monitoring infestations or population levels and monitoring seasonal dynamics require more investment. And some activities or sources of surveillance data still need to be developed as part of the strategy indicated in light blue. So our overall objective over the next years is to establish the foundation for a coordinated forest based surveillance strategy with near real time sharing of information for decision making and implement key components of that strategy that can be upscaled when sufficient support and funding, for example, from government becomes available. Thank you very much for your attention. There you go, Dr. Okay, uh, uh, can you hear me? Okay, so, uh, Brett, I was, uh, I don't see any questions in the chat box, so. One, so Jeremy is raised his hand. Uh, Jeremy, can you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, can yeah. you hear me? So, Brett, um, I'm curious. Given that you know you you would be creating an information hub and and sharing data and information on invasive species, are there any concerns about sensitivities with that data and and accessibility? And who will do what with it? Um, yeah, so that's actually a big issue at the moment. So that's, especially next year, will be one of the main focus areas is just to start looking at um, those type of data confidentiality issues. So that's been raised by some of the companies. Um, so we're going to need to look at that. And I know Bernard's um, already talking with people from the legal side um, to start tackling that issue. So, so that's a definite issue, but there are ways around it. So, you know, with, sen with sensitive data, it would only, for example, be available to those that have submitted that data or within the same company. Um, but that, that is quite a big issue that we need to, that we need to resolve going forward. 
Brilliant, thanks, Brett. Um, and hopefully we've got our, our next talk uh, lined up um, uh, by uh, Martin Tarigan um, uh, um, from April, Indonesia, um, and he's part of the uh, Plant Health Program um, there. Good day, everyone. We are grateful to participate in this Ayufro Deficient 7 Forest Health Webinar Series. Our talk title is Management of Insects and Pathogens in the Large Acacia and Eucalyptus Commercial Nursery in Sumatra, Indonesia. April is one of the largest sustainable and technologically efficient pulp and pepper producer in the world. Plantation and mill located in Rio Province, Indonesia, with office in Jakarta and Singapore. We manage 365,000 hectare plantation area and 448,000 hectares natural forest. We carry out a responsible production process based on national and international standard. April is one of the largest pulp and paper mill in the world with production capacity of 2,800,000 ton pulp per year and 1,150,000 ton pepper per year. We perform science and technology based natural resources management with advanced R&D facility where more than 200 professional scientists working. In order to supply planting material for our forestry program, there are six central nursery which produce seedling for plantation with two holding nursery for seedling maintenance. Total seedling production per year is expected around 300 million seedling per year. Nursery produce seedling to support the plantation area around 365,000 hectares. Both Acacia crassicarpa and Eucalyptus are the most produced tree species for forestry plantation every year. Nursery production is divided into mother plant house, production house, rooting house, and open growing area. Pest and disease is one of the limited factors in production nursery. Major pest and disease record for pests such as leaf roller, mite, white flies, apid, thrips, helopeltis, caterpillar, and fungus nut. Meanwhile, for diseases such as Calonectria, Kiramises, Pitium, Santomonas, Oidium, Combalaria, and Rastonia. We conduct integrated pest and disease management. IPM is an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of PND or their damage through an integrated technique such as proper diagnosis and identification of PND, monitoring PND, screening tolerant material, biological control release, including insecticide application when necessary. IPM implementation in the nursery divided into prevention, monitoring, and control activity. In prevention activity, including nursery sanitization, proper identification and regular sample evaluation, and also proper nursery practices. Meanwhile, monitoring activity is used as tools to decide to make a decision whether to control either using single control or integrated control. We will discuss further detail in the nursery sanitization. Sanitization is one of the most factors, important factors towards a healthy nursery. 
clean water, media, tube and tray, also tools used in nursery achieve through sanitization activities. We use steamer for media sanitization and we use washer machine for tube and tray and we use water treatment facility with ultra filter and also we do tool sanitization and implement food bath within the nursery area. We also conduct regular sample evaluation where in order to ensure consistent result of our sanitization works, we conduct regular sample evaluation. Every two weeks, all nursery will send regular sample of water, media, tube and tray as part of our quality control and monitoring. All sample will be evaluated for that pathogen presence and require action will be taken if necessary. So we have our in-house facility, including laboratories for diagnosis pests and disease, and also biological molecular facilities. We also conduct proper nursery practices. As we know, good nursery practices play a big role in keeping the healthiness of the seedling. It will increase plant vigor, and as a result, the seedling will be more tolerant to disease infection. Example, proper nursery practices such as on time spacing, we conduct spacing up to 50%, on time grading, balanced fertilizer application, and also trimming overground mother plant. Implementation of PND monitoring in nursery. PND monitoring recorded using tablet. This tablet directly synchronized with our system. The system will help us to check the PND incident in nursery. For example, in mother plant house, we can check the PND incidents anytime, including track back the history of PND in that mother plant house. The system also help the nursery management to locate area to control because the system will give alert to the management in which area this problem occurs. We also implement sticky trap in mother plant house. Most of sap sucking pests have attraction to specific color, mainly yellow color. Meanwhile, blue color have specific attraction for trips. We also conduct application of biological control. In this case, we use trichoderma which act as endopithic organism to compete the pathogens and may also induce plant resistance against pathogen infection. In April, the trichoderma produced in-house and has been widely used across the nursery to enhance plant resistance against pathogen infection. As an example of implementation integrated management for pests, in this case Spodoptera exigua, all insect stage, moth, caterpillar, and eggs are controlled. Moth monitor and control using light trap. So we install light trap in all nursery area especially where we know the entry point of this moth. And we conduct chemical control by following, using the insecticide, follow the FSC list. 
We also conduct cultural control where we control the height of the plants in order not to overground. We also conduct mechanical control by doing hand picking. Meanwhile, for X control, we use Trichogramma japonicum X parasitoid, which able to parasitize until 70% in laboratory and 50% in the nursery. Meanwhile, for integrated management implementation for Pitium Mirotium on Acacia crassicarpa, <coughs> including hygiene area, cultural practice, chemical control, and also other controls such as genetic resistance and biological control. For hygiene, sterilization of tools, sterilization of media, and water treatment. Meanwhile, for chemical, we use chemical spray in rooting house and dipping in chemical solution. We found also Acacia crassicarpa family differ from each other in terms of susceptibility to pitium. In this case, screening for disease tolerance is possible. Trichoderma also able to suppress the growth of pitium. Trichoderma based bioproduct can be mixed with nursery media to promote inhibition of pitium. So we are plant health program of fiber R&D April. Our team consists of 44 members with four PhD and the remaining is masters and bachelors. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I don't see any uh, I don't see any hands up here. Uh, so let me ask a question. I was seeing that uh, the biological control they're using the trichoderma. Hello, plants. everyone. Uh, I was wondering if you, because you developed that one, have you tried how that plays with the chemical, uh, how that interact with the chemical controls you have? Like usually you have to develop like uh, or develop a chemical program that adjusts to the biological agent you're applying in the soil? Is it clear what I ask? Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Felipe. Uh, I don't know if I uh, able to catch your question, but about the trichoderma. Uh, so we conduct screening first on, uh, we isolated many trichoderma, which is uh, as antagonist of uh, several pathogens that we are working with. So based on this selection, then we use the most uh, effective one for our uh, biological control, mixing with our media, nursery media. Yeah, I hope that uh, answered your question. Other, otherwise, you can ask further. Uh, I was asking, have you had to study the interaction with the fungicide to use for control? Like if the fungicide affect the trichodermas you are applying into the soil. Yes, yes, uh, thank you. So as the as the fungicide also used when necessary, so we know area with problem, so we need to also use uh, fungicide. So it has an effect to uh, the trichoderma that we apply. So of course, in this case, we need to uh, organize the best way how to apply this one. So with certain states, initially, in, at initial states, the trichoderma will work helping the 
the what they call the protection of the says the uh, first four weeks of the uh, uh, nursery and then when when the issue uh, increased and then we need to use fungicide then it will also uh, apply but of course it has some uh, negative effect to the trichoderma yeah in this case we need to organize when to the best time to use that one so all this integrated uh, in term of when the best time we need to use oh, just one last question so do you repeat the application of trichodermas after applications of fungicides uh, so we target this one especially for the early state so we only applied during the uh, media uh, mixing Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Felipe. Thanks, Martin. Um, and, and finally, um, our last talk is uh, by Rafaelia uh, Pavani, who is a, a forest policy and bioeconomy um, specialist at IBA in Brazil. So. Hello, everyone. My name is Rafaela Pavani, and I'm a forest policy and bioeconomy analyst at the Brazilian Tree Industry, or IBA. IBA is responsible to, to institutionally represent the planted reproductive chain to its main stakeholders. Uh, IBA was created in April 2014 and today we represent around 50 companies and 10 forest state entities. Among our member companies we have producers of wood panels, laminate flooring, pulp, paper, energy forests, biomass, as well as independent producers of planted trees and financial investors. The planted forest area in Brazil totalized 9 million hectares in 2019, being 6.97 million hectares of eucalyptus plantations and 1.64 million hectares of pine plantations. Besides that, our companies are strongly committed with the biodiversity agenda preserving more than 5.9 million hectares of native forests. Furthermore, the forest sector in Brazil generates 1.3 million direct jobs and more than 3.75 million indirect jobs in the cities where we are present. Um, this today totalizes around 1,000 cities. IBA's mission is linked to our firm belief that planted forests are the future of raw material that are renewable, recyclable, and friendly to the environment, biodiversity, and human life. This belief brings us to the theme of my presentation, One Health for a Changing World. For those who are unaware of this term, the One Health concept aims to achieve optimal health and well-being between people, animal, and the environment. A One Health approach can reduce potential threats between the interface of human, animal and envir environment while protecting biodiversity. The past few years have been filled with examples of what the imbalance between the interconnection of these three might cause, such as the COVID-19 global pandemic, where a virus that is thought to be from a wild animal affected the whole world and took the life from more than 4.55 million people, and the locust outbreak, which threatened the food supply across several countries. One observation that we can make about the current times is that these years that we are living will be marked in history and will be studied by the next generations. This is the moment when the world has a chance to decide whether to take the right path or the falsely is path to the future. FAO declared 2020 as the International Year of Plant Health, aiming to raise global awareness about the importance of plant health to support sustainable food production, protect the environment, and to boost economic dev the development. The FAO IPPC released in July a document entitled Scientific, scientific review of the impact of climate change on plant pests, 
If you did not have the opportunity to read it yet, I strongly suggest for you to do it. According to the researchers, climate changes have been showing signals of changing the distribution patterns, occurrence, and ab abundance of pests, and also the severity of the pest risk. Well, as my colleagues presented before me, the forest sector is filled with challenges about protecting trees from pests and disease. Many of the pests that affect the sanity of our Brazilian forests occur in other countries as well, and commercial plantations are native forests. And I believe that you all will agree with me that we already have a good number of pests and we don't need a new one. So this way our main objective today is to raise public and political awareness on forest health and to call governments and the international community to work together to address all the challenges in forest health. An important challenge that we need to talk about is the impact of introduction of invasive species. Besides affecting the productivity of our commercial and native forest, invasive species are one of the main causes of biodiversity loss. Past and current examples clearly show the extensive damage that can be caused by pest outbreaks. As I mentioned, the locust outbreak is one of the many examples. We can also mention the emerald ash butter outbreak, conipterus outbreak, the bronze bug outbreak, and unfortunately we have uh, several more examples. The rise of global market and travel alongside with the temperature increase have been creating an extremely favorable conditions to pass movement and establishment. It's not uncommon to find news about an invasive species arriving at a new country or spreading its detected area inside a territory. You might be asking yourself how invasive species are spreading to new places. Well, a pest dispersal can occur through natural conditions and also by human actions. The dispersal can occur through contaminated and unthreatened material, um, usually the ones that did not went through phytosanitary measures. For example, um, unthreatened wood packaging that has been playing a major role in spreading plant pests, contaminated seeds, planting material, soil and growing material, by convenience, cargoes, and by animal dislocation, when, uh, that is where the pest gets a free riding, by passengers traveling and, for example, bringing back home a lovely leaf from where they were, or by natural dispersal that usually occurs at the frontiers from cities, states, or, or countries. Efforts at national and international level have been made to reduce the risks of international uh, movement of pests. But unfortunately, the efforts of just one country cannot prevent or eliminate the problem. The most effective way to prevent and limit the international spread of pests is to regulate their movement through phytosanitary measures and also to ensure that the best practices are being applied to reduce the incidence of pests in the plantations or native forests. We need to come up with an approach to design and implement programs, policies, legislation and researches where multiple countries can communicate and work together to achieve better outcomes. We're talking about an effective and fast detection of invasive pests, an action plan to respond to this detection and to prevent its introduction to a new country or area. Government officials, researchers and workers at local, national, regional and global level should join forces to respond to these health threats. But how can we work together to address the One Health concept? Well, we have a few steps that we should uh, start looking at as threatening monitoring, surveillance and reporting systems at regional, national and local levels to prevent and detect invasive species and control it before its spread, understanding risk factors including socioeconomic and cultural contests for pest spillovers from native forest plantations and the other way around to prevent and manage pest outbreaks, 
um, developing capacities at regional, national, and local levels for better coordinating, co coordination and information sharing among institutions and stakeholders, increasing the capacity of the local farmers to combat and minimize the risks of pests, and promoting forest health at national and international levels. We must remember that an effective management by one farmer or one country can affect the success of others. And the international cooperation is the key to the success of countries in preventing the introduction of new invasive species. This is our chance to make a difference and work together towards a healthier future. Because as we all know, pests do not respect borders. Thank you for your attention. So I think we can go to the panel discussion now. Okay. Um, yeah, we've got we've got a question up for Rafilia just first, and then we'll roll um, straight into the the discussion. Um, so if you'd like, um, start raising your hands or, or adding uh, questions into the into the chat, um, and uh, we'll we'll roll with that. But Rafilia, um, can you see? Irene's question in the box, um, which is, is one that I also had. So, so are there existing networks with neighboring countries in South America to, to the detect invasives? Yeah, hello everyone. And thank you, Irene, for your question. Here in Brazil, we have COSAVI, that is a cooperation of South uh, uh, countries here in South America that works together, um, but mostly at levels to, to identify like pests that are, are in a country and it's spreading its area. So here we have, because I don't remember now the, the exactly name, I'll search for it and I'll, I'll send it here. But we have like some initi initiatives uh, about this here in South America. But we need to develop and work together as a, like a global system to prevent its spreads because we know that uh, in South America, for example, it's common to come by uh, frontiers and the insects like just travels and arrives here in the new country, but it also happens by like uh, transportation from with the packaging that is contaminated. So we need to increase to a global level. Great, thank you. Um, I see Brett, you've got you've got your hand up. Hi, Stuart. Thanks. So it's just for the, the broader general discussion, or are you still taking? Um, questions for the last speaker. Um, I, th I think I think we can just jump into the discussion. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's just a question for um, Angus, just about, um, on the results that he presented. So I was just wondering, with those uh, massive salvage operations, like what effect that that has on the the market? The market. I mean, does the, the does the the price then um, you know drop? Do they have problems there with regards to um, how do you say, like stabilizing the, the, the price and also the, what effect does that have on future supply now? Because, I mean, that's a whole lot of timber that would have been, you know, maybe only harvested in, I don't know, the next five or so years. And now in the next five or so years is going to be a shortage. So I was just wondering on those, on, on those type of effects of this massive salvage operation. Yeah, good, good question, um, Breton, because we had... Um, uh, Right, right across much of the plantation area, um, similar events. Um, so across, you know, the main pine growing regions. And so, um, yeah, everyone was feeling the same pain. Uh, and look, I don't have all the answers to that, but I know there was quite a fair bit of um, government um, relief money that went into helping mills cope with, um, cope with, uh, the loss in volume. Um, we also had a dummy double whammy that we had uh, COVID restrictions um, come in there as well. Um, and um, we then uh, lost our options to send um, logs overseas. So we had a really good export market with China, primar primarily with China. And so that was a, a sort of a salvation um, because we could send a lot of burnt logs uh, across to China. And then we had, um, yeah, that 
that was uh, shut down. Um, and so we then had to find a lot more other markets for that for that timber. So yeah, there was a, um, even though I mentioned that there wasn't necessarily, um, the, the salvage kept on going and the mills were still taking timber, but it wasn't um, the, all the timber that they wanted, um, but they needed it to, to stay alive. And um, they're thinking that we're gonna be, it's, it's a five to 10 year process before we will have planted um, back all the area that was lost and sort of get back to uh, time zero. Um, but yeah, they're already looking at those, the gaps in the different age classes um, that, that, um, that occurred. So um, it will be a massive challenge going forward. Um, and it'll ultimately mean that some, uh, some compartments will be harvested before they need to be. Uh, and some may need to grow on for a lot longer than they need to be just to, to meet the different markets uh, for, for pulp logs, for, uh, for saw logs, for veneer and that type of stuff. But yeah, it's a um, yeah, really good question and, and something we'll be working with over the next decade, I suspect. Yeah. Thanks, Angus. Um, Kira, do you have your hand up? I do. I actually have a question, if possible. Um, for Angus, um, I'm really interested. Do you um, predict that this boom in the Ips beetle population will have an effect on other current plantations that you have, or have an effect on future plantations? Um, because in other kind of beetle disease paradigms, when you have this boost, it just kind of overflows. Yeah, look, good question. It, and it's something that we're um, concerned about and, and really going to keep an eye on. Um, so um, one of the things that we have seen, though, is that a lot of the areas were burnt so hard that it actually, I think it actually just killed a lot of the Ips. Um, so we actually didn't, in some areas, we didn't have a, as much of a buildup of Ips as expected. Um, I think simply because that everything got burnt so hard. Um, but with all the slash that's on the ground from the from the salvage, um, and also there's a lot of green trees that were um, burnt but not killed, and we're finding Ips is building up in those. Um, and so some of the issues that we're potentially looking at in the future is around Ips and other bark beetles like Hylastes and Hylurgus building up in the slash and, and attacking the young seedlings that we plant um, back into those areas. Um, we've started to see uh, an increase in Hylurgus, um, but at this stage not attacking the young seedlings. Um, and the other thing that we're looking at is uh, those areas that are of the right age class that have been burnt but are still alive, whether Sorex wood wasp is going to build up in those. Um, so I, I'm expecting myself to continue with employment for a while because of these fires, I suspect. So. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm just flicking through seeing if anyone has their hand up. Not that I can see. Um, I've got um, some questions. Um, Martin, are you um, kind of looking at automating a lot of your processes like the disease and pest monitoring in the nursery and then I was thinking it looks like you're collecting a, a large amount of data are you kind of looking at feeding that into um, artificial intelligence or machine learning or, or things like that? Yes <clears throat> uh, thank you Scott uh, so we are initially we conducted one manually but we are in the process of uh, integrating that one into the artificial intelligence. So currently we are in the phase of testing of uh, uh, what we call uh, using this one. Yeah. So we utilize uh, uh, what we call in-house system where we have uh, uh, the tablet. Uh, we use use this tablet. Uh, so the program already install and then uh, the operator 
just use this tablet to monitor all the data, uh, to collect the data. And then this data will be directly also stored and analyzed by the system in order to uh, direct the management on where and how they will need to do the work. Yeah, so yes, the short answer is we are trying to imp uh, improve this one further and using the uh, artificial intelligence for, for this one. Fantastic. I, I thought, I just thought, yeah, with what was it, 300 million seedlings a year? Uh -huh. I mean, that it looks is. like a huge, huge data source that you're building. It so um, it's, it's, it looks like an amazing operation. Um, I've got to kind of follow if there's if there's no other questions, it's hard to kind of scan across. But um, the Brett, I guess I've got a follow up, which is very similar for the question for Rafilia is um, I think it's this initiative for South Africa is fantastic. But are you kind of looking at pushing beyond South Africa's borders? Um, Stuart, you're talking about for the surveillance program. Yeah, I guess, or, or coordinating or collaborating, because if that's, you know, if, if the, you know, you've got a lot of border and if that's your, you know, you can't really control what's happening outside of that. So, um, and, but if you don't, if, if they're not doing anything, then there's no, you yeah. know. Yeah, so we, I mean, so I'm involved, I'm helping to coordinate um, the group, it's the Forest Invasive Species Network for Africa. So it's kind of initiated by the FAO and there's different regional networks across the globe, but this is the one for Africa. So there's the, there is communication around uh, invasive species of forests, um, a lot of focus on insect pests and pathogens. Um, so that helps to an extent and we've hosted some workshops um, with regards to you know, identification of insect pests and also just to increase the networks. So that's been useful. I mean, they're limited in extent because of, of funding issues. There's no particular funding source for it. So it's difficult to, to get stuff organized and going. Um, but it does help to some extent. So I think we need to put a bit more attention into those type of, of networks. Um, and I think the bigger idea where at least I would like to see this surveillance um, going is broader across our borders as well, um, where we, you know, actually collaborating with fellow researchers and different companies and, and having at least some type of platform where we can access data like continent wide data. I think that would be the bigger picture. Um, I think funding is going to be the big issue. Yeah. Good job. And, and I guess just a quick follow up, if I may, because you, you referred to kind of um, lack of government support, I suppose, for, for these initiatives. So how are you motivating government? So, um, and I think, you know, Bernard's um, very active in this. So there is actually funding from government. It's just to, I mean, not from government, there is funding in government, but it's just about accessing that at the moment. Um, so at the moment, I mean, for the surveillance strategy, we really want to build a platform that then we can show them how something is kind of already working on a small scale. And it's then something that they can see and invest into. I think that's our idea rather than just going to them and saying, you know, you need to put however much money a year into surveillance and they don't really understand what we're saying. So that's kind of the idea. Um, and that's something that we, we're working towards. Fantastic. Thank, thanks, yeah. Brett. Um, Angus? Yeah, look, just following on from that, and, and that this is actually not what I put my hand up for, but um, the obviously one of the biggest beneficiaries of some forest surveillance program is the growers. And so, um, are they not putting their hand up to pay for some of this as well? And should they not? Should it not be a, a co-funded program? And if the growers are going to be getting a large benefit, um, and uh, big parts of the South African society and, and economy, could they not be putting pressure on, or are they putting pressure on government to co-fund surveillance? Yeah, so that's a big discussion at the moment. So the growers contribute through Forestry South Africa, and then Forestry South Africa um, funds, you know, for example, they fund some of the TPCP projects. Um, so we've just put a proposal to Forestry South Africa now this year for that surveillance project that, that I, I discussed. Um, we're still waiting to hear back. So that will then go to the different members and they would decide 
you know, if and what they're going to fund. Um, the government used to be the, that stalled. Um, so, you know, Forest Trees Africa is busy engaging government to get back on board with regards to, to funding forestry surveillance and just forestry research in general, actually. But the, the, the growers do indirectly contribute already to, to these operations. Cool. Thanks, Brett. Um, we've got a question, Rafilia. I don't know if you spot the question from Gina in the chat. Yes, uh, thank you, Gina, for your question. Um, here in Brazil, we have a few steps um, before we recognize a pest as invasive. Um, but we have to prove that a pest is here. We have to like to go to the government and talk to them and prove that a pest is here. We have to come prove uh, that it, it's spreading and the, the severity of the attack. So this uh, regist uh, registering the, the past might be up to a few years or like a few months. It depends on the severity of the attacked area. Yeah, yeah, it's basically, it depends on the government to, and then to register the product to, to control it. It's another few steps that it usually takes around five years to register. Uh, uh, a chemical here to control or even a, a biological uh, control. Uh, and like for a record time, it took us uh, a year and a half to control, uh, to register a product to control the bronze bug that it was like spread all over Brazil. So just like to, to have like, uh, to imagine how long does it take here in Brazil to, to take action. Oh, thanks. Um, Angus, you've got your hand up again. Yeah, look, I, I saw a question earlier on um, mm. um, to me about was, was there an impact of the fire on microorganisms in the soil? Um, and that's a good question. It wasn't something we initially were going to look at, but about three months after the, um, the fires, as we're coming into autumn, we had some really good rains. And so we saw a lot of fruiting uh, of mycorrhiza uh, mushrooms coming up. Um, and it was really interesting that, that um, there was a lot in the, in the unburnt areas and none in the very severely burnt areas and a bit of a gradation uh, across that burn intensity. Um, and so we've done a little bit of work at this stage, just sampling uh, roots of mycorrhiza just to see what's actually happening um, there. But it's a very preliminary uh, look, but it's something where um, we've looked at, well, we, we want to look at when we're replanting those areas that have been severely burnt, should we be um, inoculating the soil? What type of mycorrhiza should we be putting on the ceilings? And those sorts of questions. So um, it's, again, it's another work in progress. Thanks, Angus. Um, uh, Philippe? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So this is just a follow up to what Angus was explaining now. I was thinking like uh, regarding the micro like the microbes in the soil. You mentioned in our previous answer that it usually takes about 10 to 15 years to replant in those burned areas. Like I don't know if I got that correctly. So and no. I... Okay, sorry. Yeah. Oh, so it, it was more to do with all the burnt area. There was so much burnt area that to, to replant that whole burnt area would take five to ten or so years to get back to where we were before. So how long would it take or how long like, or, uh, after the fire would you consider planting I and mean, is there any treatment you plan to do to the soil or anything because you're losing quality in the soil as well. Yeah, yeah so, there is, so there will be a in some areas, there will be a long time, maybe up to five years or more before they replant, just because we don't have the seedlings. Um, um, so um, a lot of cases, the um, those areas are just going to be full of weeds, um, a lot of wattle and blackberry, um, and then they'll have to be um, sprayed out with herbicide before they plant. But um, there's no, at this stage, there's no consideration about you know, what other soil ameliorations we might need to do with those areas. So, but it's a, it's a, again, it's another thing we should be considering that 
we probably aren't. Thanks, Angus. Thanks, Angus. Um, Brett, uh, just, you've got your hand up. Um, okay. Um, well, Brett, I don't know if you're on mute or, um, but I, Rafilia, I've got one for you kind of, like I was in Brazil um, for the uh, UFRO Congress and, and afterwards visiting in Sao Paulo. And I was really impressed, I suppose, going to the nurseries uh, looking at the practices that they did with the workers in terms of they were doing exercises um, and, and things like that. And, and I think, I don't know if we do the best job of looking after our staff's uh, uh, wellness and welfare sometimes, but um, I, I was impressed in Brazil. So are you kind of, in terms of this One Health, are you kind of, I, I saw those programs there um, in terms of doing exercises every, I don't know if it was every hour or whatever in the nurseries. Um, so are you kind of linking that to biosecurity and tree health? Uh, and that could go as the human health. We, we need to think like the all the interconnections between the systems and all the, uh, the security and safety that we need to provide, that we sh could provide to the humans that are working in the forest and also to the commercial forest and native forest. Here in Brazil, we have like a, a mosaic plantation. So uh, it's all interconnected. We have like, uh, we are always talking about like to uh, our people and our forests, like commercial and native. So it's all interconnected. We need to, to look at every single uh, step and every single um, part that we could improve towards the One Health approach. But, but this is like a, a very a, a nice like exercising and it helps like their productivity as well and, and not like having back pain, for example. So it's really good. Yeah, it was, I don't know if I ans answer your question like fully, but. Yeah, um, it's I think the One Health thing, we, we talk about it a lot here and, and we, we obviously have a kind of indigenous Māori kind of view and, and, and that view is, is um, very much aligned with the One Health and, and the interconnectedness of, of things. So um, you know, I, I think it's a, a great initiative. Um, yeah. If this... Yeah. If, if oh, I yeah. may, uh, the One Health concept, it's always uh, more connected, like it has been talk broadly about like the zoonotic disease that can come outside from our forest and like especially in the human life. But we need to start to looking at like the other way around, like the interconnection, like the, the sanity of our commercial forest. We know that we have like a lot of challenges and we need like to work together. We know that like pests is spread, like they come from everywhere and like go uh, whenever they want. So we need to, to uh, ensure that we stop like this process, like work together and think about like the one health approach for the sanity of our commercial and native forests as well. Like bring this discussion, like uh, it's also important like the human health and all, but we need like to also remember that our forests belong to this conversation as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I think, um... You know, biosecurity is a people problem, as we've seen in a lot of the talks. It, they move with people, so um, that's it. Um, we can't. I think we're kind of running over time. But if there is any more questions, I'm just flicking through and having a look. Then I'm happy to for them to be asked. But it doesn't look like there's any. If anyone, go on, Angus. Just, just a very quick one for, for Martin, that I was really impressed that you had 200 scientists um, mm. at April and um, about a quarter of them were forest health um, yeah. related. So really good. <laughs> Thank you, Angus. Yes, uh, in order to support the company uh, activities, yeah, because we are big companies with more challenge, of course, with bigger uh, operation. So company really uh, serious, yeah, because this business must be conducted yeah. seriously. So with this support, we hoping we can uh, further contribute uh, to company and of course to the country and to the all nation. Thank you. <laughs> Good. 
That's mine. Um, so I think we're going to we'll just wrap up there. Um, I'll just say a, a massive thank you to all our speakers. I'll give a round of applause. Um, I thought all your talks were fantastic. Um, a big thank you to Irene, uh, to Kira, to Philippe. Thank you so much uh, for your help. Um, you've made this very easy for me and the organizing team. So, so thank you for that.